Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us this evening. PBS Books in collaboration with Kansas City PBS and KERA in Dallas, Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, is pleased to host a conversation with author Professor Kelly Lytle Hernandez in celebration of the 2022 Library of Congress National Book Festival. PBS Books is proud to partner with the Library of Congress to promote its 2022 National Book Festival. Let's take a moment to hear from the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Books bring us together as the Library of Congress National Book Festival returns in person on September 3rd at the Washington Convention Center. The festival is free for readers of all ages. We will also be live streaming three stages for audiences across the country. Featured authors this year include Janelle Monet, Leslie Jordan, Niall DeMarco, Nick Offerman, Angie Thomas, and more. So go to loc.gov slash bookfest for more. Well, that is quite a list of authors. So if you are in the DC area, the DMV, don't hesitate to go over. It is free and open to the public. But let's say you can't make it or it's a little too far for you. Then you can go to loc.gov slash bookfest for a complete schedule and you can curate your own experience to live stream. Also, for the, the following two weeks, there will be a rollout of the content from all the other stages at the National Book Festival. Well, now through August 31st, PBS Books and PBS stations across the country will host a series of 10 virtual events with 11 authors. This is our eighth event. They will be available on demand at PBS Books and at the National Book Festival website. Well, today's conversation, as you know, focuses on Professor Kelly Lytle Hernandez and her latest book, Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands. This book brings to light enormous gaps in our history books chronicling the Mexican Revolution and its interplay with U.S. politics. Let's take a moment to hear from our partner at Kansas City PBS. Welcome, I'm Cliff Keel, President and CEO of Kansas City PBS. I'm thrilled to introduce this evening's event in celebration of the Library of Congress National Book Festival. We are also thrilled to collaborate with the Kansas City Public Library as libraries are a crucial partner for PBS stations across the country. Kansas City PBS is proud to be part of this important event and we hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks. Well, you know it's impossible to proceed without thanking our library partners, 1800 Strong, as well as numerous PBS stations throughout our nation. But most of all, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Well, the moment you've been waiting for. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelly Lytle Hernandez. Kelly is a professor of history, African-American studies, and ur urban planning at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she holds the Thomas E. Lifka Endowed Chair in History and directs the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African-American Studies. 2019 MacArthur Fellowship recipient, she is the author of the award-winning books, Migra, and City of Inmates. Hernandez lives in Los Angeles. She is featured at the 2022 National Book Festival for her latest book that we are discussing today. And as we discussed, it is about migrant rebels, magonistas, and the start of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. It is my pleasure to welcome Kelly. Thank you for Thank having you. me on. It's a real honor to be with PBS Books and the National Book Festival and, of course, the Library of Congress. I'll do anything that Dr. Hayden <laughs> is involved in. 
I think most of us would. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, could you, for those people who have not yet had an opportunity to read your book, can you give us a short summary of the premise of your book, what it's about, in your own words? Yeah, of course. So Bad Mexicans tells the story of a group of revolutionaries from Mexico City who were organizing against the dictator in Mexico. The dictator's name was Porfirio Diaz. And he disparaged them for challenging his rule. He disparaged them as malos mexicanos or bad Mexicans. That's where the title of the book comes from. You know, after years of suppression in Mexico, they fled to the United States and tried to rebuild their social movement. They relaunched a rebel newspaper called Renacion. They established a political party known as the PLM, and they even established an army that raided Mexico four times from Texas between 1906 and 1910. And so the book tells a story of them um, rebuilding their social movement here in the United States and the efforts of both the U.S. and Mexican governments to suppress their uprising because of what it would mean um, to depose Porfirio Diaz in Mexico and not just rock politics in Mexico, but the United States had many um, investors in Mexico by the turn of the 20th century, and they wanted to protect U.S. investments. So it's the story of this um, rebel band known as the Magonistas and the cross-border counterinsurgency campaign against them that failed. And they were able to start the 1910 Mexican Revolution from the United States. Okay, so this story certainly left out of my U.S. history books. All right. So how did you first hear about it, get the, the idea to write this book? I mean, you, you heard about it. You, is this your area of focus as a professor? Sure, well, so I study mostly race and immigration and mass incarceration in the United States. And um, I learned about this story first as a graduate student um, at UCLA. I was taking a Mexican history course and it really blew my mind that there were these extraordinary people who were able to challenge both the U.S. and the Mexican government and incite a revolution from the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. And what blew my mind was that I'm from the borderlands. I'm from San Diego, California. That's where I grew up. And no one had ever told me this story before that my home community had really been the site of um, really the beginning of what became the 20th century's first um, social revolution in the world. And so that really got my attention. And I stayed with the story for about 20 years, um, reading everything that I could that was published on the, so the leader of this revolution, Ricardo Flores Magón and the social movement. And I was really honored to have the chance to write this book. So it seems to me lots of research and it almost seems since this was a hidden story for me, I did grow up on the East Coast, but it sounds like you grew up in the borderlands. As you said, how did you go about your research? Where did you start? And are you were some of the resources in, in Spanish um, and, and how did that work for you? Yeah, that's a great question. So this story of revolution in the borderlands is actually very well chronicled in Mexico and in Mexican American history. So these rebels, again, led by Ricardo Flores Magón are legendary in Mexico. There are streets and towns and libraries and buildings named after the revolutionaries. In fact, the Mexican government declared this year, 2022, to be the year of Ricardo Flores Magón for his many contributions to the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. In particular, he helped to push the ideas about economic justice and in, um, land justice for Mexicans that ultimately became part of the 1917 Mexican Constitution, which remains the Constitution of Mexico to this day. So um, they are very well chronicled in Mexican history and in Mexican American history. And what I have been able to do with this book, and what my goal with this book is to haul that history that's been well told and to really drive it into the center of the US canon or the American narrative. Um, so there's a couple of things I had to do. One, I had to read widely, widely in Mexican and Mexican American history but also go deep into the archive. And so the archive at the heart of this rebel story is that when the revolutionaries came to the United States and tried to rebuild their social movement, the US and Mexican governments um, infiltrated their movement with spies in particular who would um, steal their mail. 
And so there's an entire archive in Mexico City of the stolen letters and correspondence of these rebels. And so working with those letters, yes, you have to work in Spanish and in English, but also you have to work in secret code because the revolutionaries knew that they were being surveilled, that they're being watched, that their letters are being stolen. And so they began to write in secret codes that they would change every couple of days. And so the scholars who have um, researched these revolutionaries for years have had to work in English and Spanish and in secret code to be able to tell their story. Okay, so I sometimes think, and this is a perfect example of it, is that history is often better than fiction. Like you can't make this up. <laughs> I, I mean, this is incredible that every few days they changed their secret code. And did you read some of these stolen letters? Were you able to touch them or see them in person? Yeah, absolutely. No, there's an extraordinary archive in Mexico City at the Diplomatic Archive where these are bound and saved. And so you can go and you can flip through the pages of these stolen letters. There are um, several of many of the letters written in secret code and then ciphers that were developed to be able to break that code. And in fact, I'll tell you a little secret. Um, one of my sons and I have um, Land and Liberty, which is the anarchist battle cry that these revolutionaries brought to the fore of the Mexican Revolution. We have it written, tattooed in secret code on our arms. <laughs> so we absolutely love the Magonista secret code and we'll carry, with, carry it with us always, in particular their, their dreams of land and liberty for Mexico's dispossessed. Wow, that's incredible. Um, okay, so your book starts 1910. It, it's dynamic how it starts, right? It starts with, with a lynching. Um, why did you make this choice? And was the burning that occurred, did it occur on US soil or did it, did it occur, occur on Mexican soil? Sure. So this is a story of revolution that is typically understood as Mexican history. But the fact is that US and Mexican history are very entangled. And it's, it begins with the fact that you had so many US investors in Mexico who were buying up uh, much of the land and coming to dominate Mexican industries at the turn of the 20th century. That investment in Mexico is precisely what led to the rise of Mexican immigration to the United States as um, campesino, rural, indigenous communities were being dislocated from their um, homelands. They began to look for work first in Mexico and then they crossed the border to come to the United States. And when they arrived in the United States, they ran head first into the web of white supremacy um, north of the border. And what that meant is they encountered occupational segregation at work, residential segregation in their neighborhoods, and they also encountered extraordinarily high levels of racial violence. And the iconic form of racial violence at the turn of the 20th century in the United States is lynching, right? Um, so one of the ways that I want to bring readers into this as a US story is by opening the book with um, one of the most infamous anti-Mexican lynchings in US history. And that's the murder of a young man named Antonio Rodriguez in the town of Rock Springs, Texas in November of 1910. And he was accused of murdering a white woman, but he was also rumored to be a member of this rebel group that was going through the borderlands, trying to cite a revolution in Mexico that would destabilize US, namely Anglo-American investments in Mexico. And so he was burned um, at a tree. And so that's why I opened this story is to help the reader who may not be familiar with this story, but to help them understand how it is firmly grounded in US history and in particular um, US stories of white supremacy and capitalism and empire in the borderlands at this time. I mean, it is pretty incredible that within the first few pages you're able to bring to light the issue of race in such a, a staggering way, in a way that I, I, I wasn't aware, I, I hadn't really thought of it. And I think one of the things that really struck me too was you quote, one of the, the quotes from your book is you, you said, Mexican journalists portrayed that lynching is not practiced by the blonde Yankee except upon beings whom for ethnic reasons he considers his inferiors. And I found that to be powerful 
so powerful and so scary, but set up the book for everything that's about to happen. Um, how did, was this, it was an, an outcry. And in some ways, did that, did that moment spark a revolution? Right. Well, so let's pause there, right? That, that is a quote from a Mexican newspaper in 1910, just after this murder of Antonio Rodriguez. There are a lot of things that it's important about that quote, but one of them is that Mexicans are watching very closely what's happening in the United States with anti-Blackness in particular and the lynching of African-Americans. And they understand that this practice is, is grounded in anti-Blackness, as all forms of racialization in the United States are. So you have this really radical and revolutionary potential of Black and Brown um, communities beginning to understand that they have a shared enemy together. And that's one of those quotes that helps us um, get to that. So that's why I, you know, I think bringing up quotes like that and stories like that are important for us um, um, to remember. Well, I also want, wanted to touch on the investment and the, the, I think you refer to it as a, a laboratory of imperialism, right? I was shocked by 500 million. It was more than $500 million of U.S. investment was in Mexico. And that is, so you were touching on, as, as you were discussing earlier, like the injustices, the, the difference in the, the pay scale, which was extraordinary, the, the conditions then Mexicans had, had to live in because of the difference in the pay scale, the, the enormous injustice, um, all of which it would seem, and hopefully you can speak more of, um, um, Magon, Magon uh, Ricardo Flores was able to really fight and join and organize, right, in the Magonistas. Um, is that, how did, how did this get started, right? Like, because there's a lot of history, it seems to me, in how Ricardo Flores became who he was. It didn't happen overnight. It, it started with his father and his family, and it, it was really a family thing. Your book goes into it at length. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So in terms of U.S. investments in Mexico, what's really important to understand from the perspective of U.S. history is that Mexico is the, quote, laboratory or, quote, workshop of U.S. imperialism. It is the very first place that U.S. investors make major um, investments abroad, um, buying up land, nearly a quarter of the Mexican land base, dominating key industries, railroads, mining, and more. By the turn of the 20th century, about 50% of all U.S. investments abroad were in Mexico and Mexico alone. And so this is why... Mexico and the, the rule the rule of Porfirio Diaz was so important to many U.S. Investors, investors is that he created the conditions for easy U.S. investment and suppressed labor protest and um, land protest in Mexico to make it possible for U.S. investors to buy so much up. So the United States, from the perspective of U.S. history, if we want to understand the rise of U.S. global power, at the turn of the 20th century in particular, we have to understand the relationship that the United States and US investors had with Mexico and the dictator in Mexico and everything that was done to prop up his power. So that's um, a, a key issue in this book and how you can ground the story of the Magonistas in the canon of US history. It's about the rise of US global power. Now that rise of US global power in um, the workshop of US imperialism, Mexico, really creates a lot of discontent, as you might imagine, in Mexico. And Ricardo Flores Magón is one of the first people to publicly articulate that discontent in the sense that he and his brother and some friends have put together a newspaper in um, 1901 called Regeneración. And they said things on the front page of that newspaper that nobody else would say against the dictator. They said that um, Porfirio Diaz was a tyrant, um, he was a dictator, and most important, that he had made Mexicans the, quote, servants of foreigners. And this kind of rhetoric on the pages of a Mexico City newspaper was absolutely intolerable to the dictator in Mexico. 
And so he had them arrested multiple times. He had their printing presses destroyed and even had a, a gag order issued against them so that no newspaper in Mexico could um, publish Ricardo Flores Magones and his friends' writings. And so these are the conditions that are happening in Mexico that make it really important for the revolutionaries to come to the United States to organize. Now, Ricardo Flores Magón has a political you know, issue with, with Porfirio Diaz. He also has a personal issue that his father, Ricardo's father, had been a supporter of Porfirio Diaz. And Porfirio Diaz had um, allowed his father to and his family to slip into poverty um, by not affirming the fact that Ricardo's father had, had fought alongside Porfirio Diaz in some pretty important and significant battles and that the family was entitled to basically a pension, a military pension because of that. And so there was a personal beef between Ricardo Flores Magón and Porfirio Diaz that also helps to drive his fury against the dictator. I was also touched by the story of his mother mm -hmm. on his deathbed, on her deathbed rather, um, and her two sons are in jail um, and they come, they come to kind of negotiate with her. Can you, can you share that story? Because I, I just, I, I, I read it as a mother and I thought about just how, what a strong woman, <laughs> what a strong woman she is and how she so believed and also probably where her kids got their, their activism as well. That's right. So um, the story goes that when Ricardo Flores Magón and his older brother Jesus were in prison in Mexico City, and they were really in the basement, the bowels of this decrepit um, colonial prison, Porfirio Diaz sends some agents to the home of their mother um, and their, their little brother, Enrique was there at the time, and tries to convince the mother, to convince her sons to um, silence their protests against the dictator. But the story goes that on her deathbed, um, she spoke to the agents of the dictator and said, you know, I'd rather die and have my sons die in prison than to ask them to be silent. And that is um, a story that is recorded um, by Ricardo's little brother, Enrique. We're not entirely sure it's completely accurate or, or honest. Enrique is, is known for, um, you know, embellishing some of the, the personal history of the Flores Magón brothers, but it does seem to be an accurate representation of the mother's support of the activism of the Flores Magón brothers. So can you share, obviously, it seems like there's a lot going on, right? These brothers end up in jail, they get out, there's, there's um, this actually turns into a huge manhunt. And I think one of the first FBI um, big cases. Uh, so exactly what's the extent, how long is it happening and and what 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 comes of it? Yeah, so the Flores Magón brothers and their friends come to the United States in more or less January of 1904. They enter in Laredo, Texas. Within days of crossing the border, they notice that they're being followed everywhere and that they know that those are um, spies sent by Porfirio Diaz. So they flee first to San Antonio, Texas, and then to St. Louis, Missouri. And they're able to restart their newspaper, Regeneración, and establish a political party, a Partido Liberal Mexicano, the PLM. And they're able to start an army um, of the dispossessed, mostly of these Mexican migrant laborers who would been kicked off their lands in Mexico and were looking to do anything they could, include fight to get their lands back. Now, as they are organizing this newspaper, this political party, this army, the Mexican government reaches out to the United States um, government, the Department of State, Department of Justice, President Roosevelt, and more to help put together a counterinsurgency campaign and one of the most significant roles that the United States government plays is that they, the U.S. Postal Service allows agents of the Mexican government, including a private detective here in the United States, as well as U.S. Marshals and others, to open up the rebels' mail. And why that's so important is that by opening up the rebels' mail, they're able to um, figure out where all of the, like, the rebel cells or focos are across the borderlands. 
to monitor all of their activities and their plans for armed raids into Mexico. And once Ricardo Flores Magón goes on the run and he begins to live as a fugitive across the United States, in Canada and elsewhere, they use that stolen correspondence to track him down. And over a course of about a year and a half, um, U.S. and Mexican agents are tracking Ricardo Flores Magón across the United States, Canada and elsewhere. And they find him in a shack, in a hideout on the edge of Los Angeles in August of 1907. They kick in the door. Um, they find Ricardo and two of his friends. They brawl for about an hour in the shack. It spills out into the street. Ricardo and, his, Ricardo and his friends began to shout out their names because they're in a largely Mexican community. And people begin to understand that this man who had been fighting for justice in Mexico, who was now an infinite, infamous revolutionary, who had been hiding out right there at the edge of Los Angeles. And they began to shout for his release. Um, the U.S. agents, private detectives, LAPT, LAPD officers and others refused to let them go and drag Ricardo Flores Magón to jail. Um, all the way, they're being followed by this growing crowd of Mexicans who are protesting the arrest of Ricardo Flores Magón in the United States. Um, but Ricardo does about three years in jail and prison here in the United States. And the, the hope of the U.S. and Mexican government was if they could incarcerate the so-called leader of this revolution, that the revolution would die, that they had decapitated the uprising. But in fact, um, there were far more organizers who were still free, in particular women really stepped up and leaned in and led the movement um, while Ricardo Flores Magón was in, in jail. They also smuggled correspondence to him back and forth from solitary confinement. So there's these extraordinary um, Mexicanos who were doing um, revolutionary work and helped to, to build the outbreak of the 1910 revolution while Ricardo Flores Magón was in jail. And is there one woman who stands out to you the most? Oh, there's so many women I want to talk about. <laughs> um, but today I'll talk about one woman in particular, um, Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza, who was an extraordinary autodidact from the mountains of Durango. Um, she cut her teeth as, an, as a labor organizer advocating for minors um, in Mexico. She started an anarchist feminist newspaper called Vesper. And after years of incarceration in Mexico, you know, she was arrested so many times that she stopped writing her name like on the jail forms. And rather, she would just simply write sedition and rebellion where her name was supposed to go. <laughs> she comes up to the United States with everybody else. And she um, is a part of the Mabonistas uprising. And as she goes on to join Emiliano Zapata's army, helps to, to ghost write his plan de Ayala and is a really important um, advocate for women's rights and labor rights um, in Mexico during and after the revolution. So I like to lift up the name of Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza. Wow. Well, for those of you out there just joining us, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. You are watching PBS Books, and it is my pleasure to be here speaking with uh, Professor Kelly Lytel Hernandez discussing her latest book, Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire and Revolution in the Borderlands. Back to the conversation. Well, it's an incredible conversation. I feel anyone who's joining us, I hope you're learning a lot. Uh, I know in this book, I've been learning so much and it's incredible. I think even if you know um, about Mexican history, you will learn because um, Professor Hernandez has done so much incredible research. But what is unique about this book, I'm going to jump into my question, which is, it is written like a thriller. It is so incredibly interesting um, how you draw us in and how these characters jump out um, of your book. And I was hoping you could speak a little bit about your creative process in that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they are simply extraordinary historical characters who um, confronted some of the most powerful people on earth at the turn of the 20th century, including, including Perfio Diaz and, and Teddy Roosevelt. Um, so they had the power of personality. Um, for me, what I wanted to do with this book was to crack open the canon of US history and to smuggle in key moments of Mexican American and more broadly Latinx history to show how um, Mexican and Mexican American protagonists are at the center and the heart of the U.S. story and how key themes that we know in U.S. history, such as empire, such as 
race or white supremacy or capitalism, um, that you really can't understand those histories, certainly not in the 19th and 20th centuries, without talking about Mexico and including Mexicans and Mexican Americans. So that was my intellectual challenge with this book, is to insert into the heart of the US canon, Mexican and Mexican American history. And the way to do it was, I felt, it was this incredible group of revolutionaries who have um, you know, such a dramatic cinematic story to tell that's got armed battles, it's got betrayals and love affairs and these really um, ambitious personalities. And I'm taking this riveting tale of revolution in the borderlands and smuggling into the heart of the US story, these key dynamics. So the, the Magonistas, so Ricardo Flores Magon and his, his band of, of rebels help us to understand the rise of US imperialism at the turn of the 20th century and its impact upon persons, namely non-white and indigenous and black folks around the world. It helps us to understand the complexity of white supremacy in, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, in particular, it helps us to understand that um, growing out of Jim Crow, you had the creation of something called that historians you know, often call as Juan Crow um, across the Southwestern United States. Yes, through the immigration regime, what many, many people have um, studied, but also through economic, political, social subordination. Um, and it also helps us to understand the rise of policing, right? So the FBI is established in the summer of 1908, just days after the Magonistas launched their most lethal raids in Mexico. And the FBI, which Teddy Roosevelt had initially imagined as being a national police force to, um, to enforce land laws across the United States, quickly pivots. And one of its very first big cases is to suppress the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution by arresting as many of the Magonistas as possible before they could sow enough discontent that the revolution would begin. And so the FBI, which grows to be a counterinsurgency super force across the course of the 20th century, really cuts its teeth in trying to suppress the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. So all of these stories, you, know, you can't understand um, policing, race, empire, um, white supremacy without understanding Mexican and Mexican American history. And this is just a riveting story that it, it gives it to us like candy, right? It's a, it definitely is a thriller. Um, but I hope that people walk away from the, this book feeling much more informed about US history. I think they will. I also think the timing of the book, I mean, all around me, I feel like we're gearing up for the 250th anniversary of the United States. And for someone like me who spends a lot of time with books, um, I love seeing a book like Bad Mexicans that is telling this story that wasn't prior to this book really in the in the, I guess, the canon of U.S. history, right? Mm -hmm. And so being able to tell these stories of how the U.S. Um, is where it is today, especially as it's talking about imperialism, especially as it's kind of showing the true colors that through historical documents, it's really exciting to have a resource like this and to make it so interesting for even non-historians, right? People who, you know, people who love historical, fiction, like this kind of, you know, it seems like really this all happened. It's like, it's incredible. It's truly incredible. Um, so ultimately, for those people who don't know, I don't want to spoil the story, but it is historical. What was the outcome of the Mexican Revolution? Did the Mag Maganistas, like, they, they just, I know some of them ended up on a commune, but, but what was the outcome in, in Mexico and, and how did, with the FBI as well? Sure. Well, the Mexican revolution officially begins in November of 1910 and it lasts until 1917 when Mexico adopts a, a new constitution. So there's a couple of things. The early revolutionaries, including Magonistas up north, but largely led by Emilio Zapata and Francisco Madero and other names um, that are more familiar um, to us here in the United States, they do remove Porfirio Diaz from power, um, but then a civil war begins um, for control over the future of Mexico. And that 
doesn't get resolved until 1917. Now, Ricardo Flores Magón um, never returns to Mexico to participate in any of these battles or to, to lead um, during all of the Civil War. Why not? Well, um, a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost is that by 1910, 1911, he was a avowed anarchist and he did not believe in simply replacing Porfirio Diaz with a new government. He wanted to see anarchism reign um, across Mexico, if not more broadly, of course. Um, he had also long believed that he was an intellectual and not a fighter, and so that his contributions to the revolution would be about um, fomenting discontent and about sharing ideas, um, revolutionary ideas. So he did not go on to fight in the um, revolution. However, many of the ideas he did put forward and did the Magonistas, in particular around economic justice, around labor rights and land rights, those do get incorporated into the 1917 Mexican Revolution. And so Ricardo Flores Magón dies here in the United States in Leavenworth Prison um, after he is arrested one final time um, for, um, for more or less um, encouraging or discouraging people for um, signing up for World War I to fight in World War I. He dies in Leavenworth Prison. And many people say that he, he died a rebel, right? That he was one of the people who was unbowed, that he maintained um, his most um, radical ideas right until the day that he died in 1922. Um, so that's who Ricardo Flores Magón is. The Magonistas did not go on to become the major fighters of the revolution. I think this is why we don't know so much about them. Um, but their ideas did persist and they continue, of course, to be contested um, in Mexico when it comes to labor rights and land rights. One of the things that uh, struck me as I was reading your book was that because of what was happening, it, the US immigration services, you actually chronicle or, or discuss the building of the first border fence. Um, and I was hoping that you could just kind of expand on what you found and when that happened in relation to everything going on with the Maganistas. Sure. Well, it is the border fence, but it's also, you know, the first, I believe to be the first mass deportation of Mexicans from the United States is of the Maganistas. Um, they in Southern Arizona have been planning a major armed raid on Mexico and so U.S. immigration officials working very closely with um, consular officials from the Mexican government put together a series of raids and arrests in um, 1906 that swept across southern Arizona, arresting Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, and um, resulted in the first mass deportation of Mexicans from the United States right into the hands of Mexican police officials um, and so that they could be punished in Mexico for their activities against the regime. So the United States and, and the Mexican government have been working very closely together on immigration issues, right? Using the creation of this thing called deportation in the United States, which was relatively new and pretty much unused in particular against Mexican nationals in the early 20th century. They used this new tool of governance um, to suppress the Magonistas and to um, remove them from the country and, and to turn them into the hands of Mexican um, police officials. Once the Mexican Revolution begins, you're right, um, this is not my research, but others have talked about how the first U.S. border, U.S. Mexico border fence is constructed um, for a variety of reasons, but one of them being to keep out the large number of Mexican refugees who were coming into the United States um, during the revolution. So these stories of immigration, of border control, Right. They're all right here in the middle of this this history of Ricardo Flores Magón and the Magonistas. It's incredible. Um, I have a dozen other questions to ask you, but I'm not going to go into them because, as everyone knows, you will be at the Library of Congress National Book Festival on September 3rd. Is this your first time? This is my first time. I'm looking forward to it. OK, it is so incredible. Have you planned out outside of your talk what you're going to see? Well, I haven't planned it out yet, but I do plan on using my time on the flight to look very closely at the schedule. And, and Make sure you do, because I will tell you, 
I went in 2019. It was my first time ever. This convention center is incredible and there's hundreds of thousands of people there, but there's room for everyone, you know, and there's so many different genres. Um, and I found in so many ways that I, you know, I would have my favorite author was talking at one time and then someone I was super interested in or someone referred like the same time. And the good news is this year, pick who you want to see, and then you can capture that other content later. You can view it later. It'll be on demand. So not immediately, but within two weeks of the third. I know you'll probably be busy at school at that point teaching your students, um, but it's still a great opportunity to be able to have access to that incredible content. And so that day, you'll be discussing more about your book. Is that correct? That's right. We'll be talking about bad Mexicans. Awesome. I'm sure there are lots of secrets still in there, including secret codes and maybe a cipher in the middle that you'll uh, you'll pull out. <laughs> um, so growing up, did you find yourself going to libraries? Was that part of your your drill or when did you when did you fall in love with being able to do research and and writing? Absolutely. So I've always been a, a bookworm, a bibliophile. Um, li libraries and archives to this day are my my safe space, right? This is the place where I like to spend most of my time quiet um, with a book, reading, getting lost in a story, lost in the past. So um, I'm very much a, a library kid. Um, we go there after school. And um, to this day, you know, I'm very fortunate to be the director of the Ralph Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA. And we have a library. And one of our um, goals is certainly to, to build up and make sure that we're preserving as many um, books about um, Black life and by Black authors um, from as distant past as we can get them right on up to contemporary. So it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to engage in the work of librarianship, right? Yes, yes, for sure. You know, your book has the themes of economic and racial justice. And I think, um, is it just coincidental? Because the last few years, I mean, those are always been important themes, but I think there's a... Um, more people are paying attention than before, which which is good. Um, is it coincidental that this book came out now? You said you were working on it for 20 years, which is quite a while. So at what moment did you know that this was probably a really good time for this book to come to fruition? Oh, sure. Well, no, I've been working on these issues, especially involved in the movement and mass incarceration, you know, my entire teenage and adult life. Um, this book is really, it takes off from one chapter in my last book, City of Inmates, which chronicles the rise of mass incarceration in Los Angeles from the colonial period up to the Watts uprising. And this story, The Maguanistas, I, I write about in that book because Ricardo Flores Magón was imprisoned in Los Angeles for so long. And from sol solitary con confinement in the LA County Jail, he was able to help to organize um, the series of raids on Mexico in 1908 that really helped to destabilize the regime. And so his story about organizing from behind bars is really important for us to remember that incarcerated people have often been at the heart of social revolution, um, even amid the rise, in particular amid the rise of mass incarceration. So heading into um, 2020, 2019, 2020, I had the full archive of the Magonistas in my computer. I had it all digitized. And so I was very fortunate to have that because when the world shut down, when archives shut down, I had this archive to work with to be able to write this book. So this was my quarantine book in many ways. That's when it actually got written. Although the story has been in my heart for 20 years. That's an, an amazing story. Um, so what's up next for you? I know this is still kind of new, but what are you working on? Um, I am working with a group of Black radicals to write um, or co-edit a, a book of their, their organizing within the last couple of years, especially um, since the killing of Trayvon Martin. Um, so that book, I, we hope to be out next year. I'm also working with the Mellon Foundation and others on developing a major archive of the era of mass incarceration here in Los Angeles, collecting up oral histories, but also what we call carceral ephemera, the letters that we've written to one another back and forth from jail and prison, um, our protest art, our mixtapes, everything 
that um, we've created during this period of mass incarceration um, as we've tried to dismantle this regime. So that we're developing this archive um, of the age of mass incarceration. So those are the two big projects that I'm working on um, currently along with a couple other immigration projects. So I'm, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you're super busy. It's really wonderful. And we're so glad that you could take time out of your busy schedule to share with us more about Bad Mexicans, um, your latest book. Well, thank you so much. I, we do need to close the program, but it has been such a pleasure to get to know you, to hear about your process, about your book, about the Maganistas, um, and, and to learn. You know, I think so many of us out there, we just we didn't know this part of history. And I think it's so wonderful that you were able to craft this book in such a way that anyone can pick it up and, and fall in love. And, and it's a page turner. <laughs> so I hope everyone enjoys it. Um, thank you. Um, until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. I do want to remind you that on September 3rd is the Library of Congress National Book Festival from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. You can go to loc.gov slash bookfest. Also, PBS Books has um, a, 10, a series of 10 events where we are interviewing authors and talking about their books and their role at the National Book Festival this year. Once again, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. Until next time, happy reading. <laughs>